Good evening and thank you for joining WXXI, the virtual little theater and the Jewish Federation of Greater Rochester for this special preview screening and discussion of Harbor from the Holocaust, a new documentary from PBS. I'm Mona Segatola Slami, afternoon and evening announcer on WXXI Classical 91.5, and I'm here as the moderator and host for this program. Harbor from the Holocaust is the story of nearly 20,000 Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi-occupied Europe during World War II to China in the port city of Shanghai. This new film distributed by PBS explores the extraordinary relationship of these Jewish people and their adopted city of Shanghai, even through the bitter years of Japanese occupation and this Chinese civil war that followed. In the documentary, we hear from people of very different tales of how they lived in Shanghai, what their families experienced and how they were able to function on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm honored to have Sarah Walters here to help introduce this evening. She is the Holocaust Education and Community Relations Program Director for the Jewish Federation of Greater Rochester. Good evening, everyone. I am so glad to be here tonight representing the Jewish Federation and the Center for Holocaust Awareness Information and Information or HI, which is the branch of our Federation that works directly with our local Holocaust survivors, their families and the entire community as we work to honor victims of the Holocaust, those who survived and those who carry on these vital stories and ensure that the Holocaust is not forgotten. It is those very stories that make tonight's event and this new documentary so meaningful and exciting. We recognize in our work and our study that each individual holds in their very own existence a unique story that is in its own part a little piece of our world. And so tonight I'm so thrilled to be in partnership in the first of two events sharing these stories brought to a new light through Harbor from the Holocaust. And I'm so excited to hear this evening from the voices of those with their own stories, knowledge, and a unique experience to share. Thank you all so much for being here, and I'm so glad we could be a part of this evening. And it's as Sarah says, these human personal stories, as well as the larger historical context that I hope will help us better understand our world as we learn from the film and discuss it afterwards and include connections to music and culture and considering perhaps even what this story means for understanding the plight of refugees and people in conflict and crisis today. The full documentary will premiere on WXXI TV on September 8th at 10 p.m. And this evening, we get to see a 20 minute preview of the film and afterwards share your questions as part of the discussion. And we're joined by a wonderful group of panelists, Michael Dubkowski, Sheila Weinbach, and Renee Joles. And now here, is the preview of Harbor from the Holocaust. Major funding provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional support provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Philip Chosky Charitable and Educational Foundation, the Posner Foundation of Pittsburgh, and by viewers like you. Thank you. It was a strange atmosphere. When you're on a boat, that sort of feels like vacation. But on the other hand, you were really sailing into a black hole. You didn't know what in God's name awaits you there. I wondered, would any of us ever be all right again? other city in the world during the Holocaust getting to save. So many Jewish life like Shanghai did. Most of them live right in this neighborhood here. And my question to you will be, pourquoi Shanghai? You live in Germany, you live in Austria, you live in Poland. Why are you coming to here? I was in Vienna from 
one to about 11 years. I was a skier and I was an ice skater, and it was the perfect life. My dad owned a furniture store in Berlin. It was a large family. My father was one of nine. We kids played, and it was just like a regular childhood. There was absolutely nothing to warn of what was going to happen. In November 9, 1938, which is known as Kristallnacht, or Night of the Broken Glass, that's when everybody started saying, oh, this is getting bad. My aunt and uncle knew that the time had come. We get out now, or we don't get out. The problem was that while there was a lot of sympathy in the world, very few countries wanted to accept us. My father, who was a career diplomat, uh, was posted to Vienna, Austria, to the Chinese legation there in the spring of 1937. And as soon as Hitler came in, the persecution was so public, so humiliating, he just couldn't stand by. So he came up with a very ingenious strategy. Situated near the mouth of the Yangtze River, it is the biggest city in China. As the largest seaport in the Far East, it dominated the commerce and foreign trade of China. So what happened to Shanghai was that it was essentially divided up. Different imperialist powers would go in. It started with the British in 1840, after the Opium War. And then the Americans came in. They got a part. Later, the French arrived. And then, starting in the 1930s, you have the Japanese. From North China, down the coast to Shanghai, roll the storm clouds of war. The Japanese began invading China in the early 1930s, and they start in the north in Manchuria and gradually come closer and closer. And in 1937, they gradually are closing in on Shanghai. They encircle it. When Japan routed the Chinese government, they left, and they left the port of Shanghai with nothing. You know, with no immigration, no passport control, nothing. So my father seized on that opportunity to issue visas to the one place that didn't require visas, Shanghai. Somebody says, you know, there's a long line standing in front of the Chinese consulate. Why don't you go there? And my father went to that long line, and he stood in line, and within five minutes, he had a visa. And he came and said, say, we can always go to Shanghai. That's all he knew. In their wildest dreams, they never thought, I'm going to be living in Shanghai. I don't think that ever entered anybody's mind until it happened. When I read about the faraway land, I saw lovely pictures of dainty Chinese ladies in long silken gowns, strolling in beautiful gardens. Butterflies fluttered about the snowy white heads of huge chrysanthemums. And then, the anchor dropped. The engine stopped. The gangplank came down and connected us to our new world. And what a world it was. Shanghai was chaos, dirty, unmanaged. From here to here, you weren't walking alone. There was always one line of people, another line, another line, probably with some goats and pigs slithering between you. We loaded our belongings on rickshaws. They pulled us to a flea bag hotel where we made the acquaintance with the scourge of Shanghai. Bed bugs, mosquitoes, rats. But there were no guns. Nobody shot at us. The people who got off those ships, many of them had no money at all. They came with 10 marks in their pocket from Germany. And how much could that possibly provide? And here they are trying to find a place to live. My mother began to cry, and my father said, we'll get you out of here, we'll get you out of here. I 
closed my eyes against the light. I tried to shut out the busy noises around me. And right there, young and as green as I was, I made up my mind that I would have as little as possible to do with China. Shanghai would serve as a waiting place, a place to go from a place of home. The Jewish community of Shanghai was actually very diverse by this point. There were the Jewish refugees coming from uh, Vienna and from Berlin. There was also a Russian Jewish community, Russian Jews who had come after the Russian Revolution. But the first wave were the Baghdadi Jews who come in the 19th century. All of the Baghdadi Jews who came were global financiers already. They were dealing with India, they were dealing with London. And they end up taking over the opium trade. I think ultimately what the wealthy Jews realize is, is that their fate is tied to these refugees. They, they can't turn their back on them. Victor Sassoon, who is really the king of Shanghai, he's a billionaire, very influential. What happens over the next year and a half, two years, is this ballet that goes on, or you could call it a con job, where Victor Sassoon encourages the Japanese to believe that he's talking to the British government, he's talking to the Americans, he'll think of investing in Japan. Just keep on protecting these Jews who are coming in and I'll make sure things work out. And so the Baghdadi Jews begin to find the refugees housing to feed them, helping them pay for things. There were one or two Jewish families, very wealthy, and one of them sent some kettle trucks to pick us up and bring us to some home in one of the Chinese areas. You walk down the alley and you see laundry hanging out everywhere and you're living practically on top of each other. One of the things that was absolutely shocking is that they would have a toilet in their room. They would have buckets. Anybody who doesn't know what the honey bucket is, it's the toilet that gets picked up every day by a big wagon, and the wagon gets filled and got drawn through the lane, and it used to spill a little bit of the stuff on the road. The living conditions were way more primitive than in other parts of Shanghai. Hongqiu, where the refugees lived, had been occupied by the Japanese in 1937. Sometimes you could see these little straw packages, and we all knew those were dead babies who had died over the night of starvation and things like that. I was stunned by that. And not only did I have a sense of empathy for the difficulties of the Chinese, which, which were the same as ours, surviving in a very difficult environment, but I guess underneath that was also the fear that that could happen to me. I realized it was one world. The Chinese were very, very gracious to the immigrants. We lived amongst them. They were poor, and they accepted us. There was definitely compassion for each other. They had nothing to give us any more than we had to give them, other than friendship and being together. How do you feel if you are marginalized, if what you want doesn't matter, if you don't have a government to protect you, if you think nobody even knows you exist? It's a feeling I've never forgotten. And that's how the refugees felt. I think for the parents, this was the most heartbreaking thing. They thought, my children have no future, my children have no hope. What I think really changed that for them was the Kaduri School. A very wealthy Jewish man by the name of Horace Kaduri 
opened a school for the Jewish kids. Life at the Kaduri School was, for me, one of the most important things of Shanghai. I have memories of doing what you would consider normal things under unnormal circumstances. And you made lifelong friendships because you were all in the same boat. We had Jewish youth organizations and we had theatrical plays. It was always to a Jewish theme, all the time. We were taught you are Jews no matter what. And that sticks. A savage blow unparalleled in infamy. Pearl Harbor, December the 7th, 1941. Yet a day promised intolerable suffering and sacrifices to so many nations, and eventually presented Shanghai Jews with a whole new set of troubles and undiluted anguish. Some of the wealthy Jews were actually um, imprisoned and tortured by the Japanese because the Japanese believed that they had been conspiring with the British and the Americans against the Japanese. Victor Sassoon has fled. These wealthy Jews who had protected the refugees, who had supported them, now were powerless. The Japanese were now in charge and are formally allies with the Germans. Suddenly, without any warning, there appears in the newspapers a proclamation which says that in 90 days, you have to give up where you live and move to the worst part of town, half destroyed during the war. Maybe half the Jews were living in other parts of Shanghai, and they were all ordered to abandon their apartments, abandon their belongings, and trudge over to this ghetto, which was monitored by Japanese guards, which was adding another 10,000 people to a community that was already filled, overflowing. They're essentially doubling the population of Jews. The room was like maybe 15 feet by five feet long for the three of us, had one window. But we lived there, my father, my mother, and I, for six or seven years. It's... Where we wound up, it was a room with 14 people sleeping there. We put like blankets on the sides of our bed, undressed and dressed in bed, because there was no other space. We had a small table in front of the bed, and that's where we took our meals. There was so much poverty, people getting sick, people dying of, of all these rare diseases. You see someone that you, you would see on a regular basis and the next day they were gone, they died because they got ill, they didn't have enough food, they had dysentery, it was, it was just dreadful. And a lot of Europeans died as well, especially the elderly. Hong Q was bordering on despair and hysteria was putting it mildly. It took me a long time to go to sleep that night. There was so much to worry about. The American Joint Distribution Committee was the main organization trying to deal with a worldwide refugee crisis as Jews were fleeing Europe. There are tens of thousands of refugees in Shanghai. The crisis has become so big, the Joint finally decides that it has to do something and they go to a woman named Laura Margolis. They bought these huge, like, warehouses, what we called Jaime. And Laura Margolis was able to get $100,000, and with that money, he spent to get a hospital, 200-bed hospital. I was a secretary. I was extremely happy to be working in a hospital because I saw people were being helped. Even though it was war years, life started picking up and people tried to recreate a little Europe. 
they begin to build their own independent communities with German newspapers and German cafes and orchestras. It's very important to have some culture so that you don't feel, even though you physically you're alive, but your mind has gone dead and you've lost everything that you've always had. Community action can make an enormous amount of difference. And that's what happened when we were finally locked up by the Japanese in a kind of a ghetto. The energy of adversity ended up in some kind of creativity even. And that helped the people to survive. The whole experience taught me that nothing is for sure. Everywhere I live, I know that any day it might not be home anymore. And it's not that devastating if it does happen. I've never carried a chip on my shoulder. Why me? If I ask why me, it's why me did I get saved and didn't get killed and was able to live in Shanghai and grow up. That's the why, you know, that's the why me. We live in an age now where there are people that need to escape their countries because of the horrors that are going on. It breaks my heart to see people trying to come to our country that is plentiful being turned away. This never happened to us when we went to Shanghai. Shanghai opened their arms to us. Hey, I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> Welcome. Have a seat, sit down. Nobody can really imagine what it was like for me to f meet you and find out who your father was. My father was never reunited with any of the people that he helped. He was unknown to most of them. And so when I meet these people, I feel that my father's efforts were worth it. It's like a miracle to me. And you and I have become very good friends. And it doesn't change the darkness, but it gives light into the darkness. This miracle occurred because certain people stepped up at the right moment. I think the Baghdadi Jews did. I think Laura Margolis did, Hafang Shan. So I think there were individuals who did it. But more than that, this was a place, the most unexpected of places that saved these Jews when they needed help the most. Beyond politics, beyond, you know, rivalries and economics and military things, in the end, there was a human connection that was established between the Chinese and the Jews. And I think that created a common bond that you certainly didn't see anywhere else in the world. That is my third time seeing that preview and still a bit overwhelmed by it. But there are fascinating stories, even in the short preview of Harbor from the Holocaust, which you can see the full program next week, Tuesday, September 8th at 10 p.m. on WXXI TV. And I hope you can stay tuned now for our discussion. Let me quickly introduce our guests who will be discussing their perspectives and take your questions, which you can post in the Facebook comments. Michael Dubkowski is Professor of Religious Studies at Hobart and William Smith Colleges with a concentration in Judaic Studies and Holocaust Studies 
And since 2004, he has led college students on study trips to Germany and Poland. Renee Joles is a violinist who's a professor at the Eastman School of Music. She enjoys an eclectic career as soloist and chamber artist, specializing in a wide variety of styles from Baroque to the contemporary. And in 2014, she inaugurated the Eastman School of Music's celebrated annual Holocaust Remembrance Concert Series, featuring faculty performances of neglected masterworks by composers who perished or survived during this time and modern works based on Holocaust themes. And Sheila Weinbach was born in Rochester, New York to immigrant parents from Ukraine and Romania. And she lived in what was then the Jewish section of Rochester, Joseph Avenue. She had the privilege of knowing many families that survived the Holocaust, but lost most of their families. And one of the immigrants was Kurt Weinbach, who escaped Austria to join his brother in China. And although most of their family members were murdered in the Holocaust, both brothers and their parents survived. And Sheila's husband, Kurt, lived in China for eight years. So thank you all of you for being here and being part of this discussion. Sheila, could you start by sharing some of what you recognize from conversations from fans and family while watching this documentary, perhaps add some more of the story as you heard it? Yeah. There were many, many familiar scenes, both because I had traveled to China and because my husband had told me about it. And so many of my friends who were his friends and classmates uh, had that experience. But I want to put it a little bit in context. There was some mention of Jews in other parts of China. And um, my husband lived in a big city called Tianjin, which is now Tianjin, which is the harbor for Beijing. And uh, But he did spend three weeks in that horrible warehouse of a place uh, two of the kids that I grew up with and went to summer camp with um, in Rochester had been in that ghetto. And they had come there as preschoolers. And by the time they came to Rochester, they did not have any knowledge of how to use a knife or a fork or a spoon. They were like little animals. They had to be civilized. And so... Um, living in that kind of place. And I don't know if you could get a picture from the warehouse. What they, the bunks were three bunks high and they were very, very close to one another. And so they really couldn't escape. But um, the, the Jewish experience in China was lit, uh, very spread out, mostly on the east side of China. Uh, there were the Keifang Jews that lived in the city of Kaifeng. And um, depending on which history you read, they were settled there. They came from the Middle East and they, uh, it was the China trade route, the Indian, India China trade route. And they lived in Kaifeng. And the, from where uh, the sixth or the eighth century. And then uh, the major Jewish settlement was in Harbin and Manchuria, and people came there for the start of the building of the China, uh, Chinese railroads. Many of them were engineers who came from Siberia. And uh, then a lot of them escaped uh, from the, the Russian Revolution. And then um, there were settlements in Tsingtao, Mokdin, Harbin, and Tinsen, where my husband lived for eight years. And I think we can get into that a little bit later, but um, I do want to say that um, I met many of the people. This is a, a book by one of my friends, uh, Evelyn Rubin, who went there from Germany as an eight-year-old. My husband escaped from, China, from Austria. And when I saw the scenes of Crystal Knight, he was only eight, year, uh, eight or nine, when well, no, he was 10 years old, when Crystal Knight happened. And he remembers seeing people sitting on the sidewalk with toothbrushes scrubbing the sidewalks. And he also saw his synagogue burn. And so there were so many scenes in there, I, I felt like, uh, I could identify with them, even though I was fortunate enough to have 
not had to, the experience. So. You said, as you said, that this was both, I mean, this was an escape from something worse, but there were, as we've seen, things were very, very challenging there in Shanghai, especially when people were relegated to ghettos. And what I was talking about, the different places in China, um, where my husband was, it was called Tianjin, or mm -hmm. uh, Tianjin, and that was halfway between Harbin, Harbin and uh, Shanghai. So people traveled in the good times back and forth all the time. During the war years, they were not able to travel. And Michael, as someone familiar with the history and teaching this to students now, what are some things that stand out to you from what we've seen, whether I guess the larger historical forces or as we've seen that interact so much with individual decisions? Yeah, firstly, I, I was very moved by the portion of the film um, that we saw and, and looking forward to seeing it next week. This is an important story and it's a story that um, I don't think is is well known. So I, I guess I would say a couple of things. I would um, think of the of the history of the Shanghai community and the Shanghai ghetto, so to speak, uh, as part of the history of the refugee, the refugee crisis then of the of the nineteen thirties. Um, particularly uh, exacerbated by Kristallnacht, by the night, night of the broken glass uh, windows, glass crystals in November of 1938. And really the um, unwillingness of um, almost every country in the world to do anything to solve the problem. Shanghai becomes a haven because you didn't need visas to get into Shanghai. The Japanese who essentially occupied the city in 1937 didn't require papers. If you could get there, if you could leave uh, Europe, whether it's uh, Central Europe, Germany and Austria, or Eastern Europe, and somehow find your way to Shanghai, um, yes, you would encounter a very difficult situation. You would encounter poverty. Uh, and as we enter into World War II, meeting the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor, um, uh, the conditions deteriorated remarkably, but nevertheless, um, we talk about it as a ghetto, um, uh, but it, it's, it has some similarities to the ghettos of, that the Nazis created in Eastern Europe but it, 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 all, it also has some differences. So I would want to think of both the similarities and differences. Here we have a, a place where 20,000 or so, give or take, uh, Jews could uh, find a haven. And uh, even under difficult circumstances, as the, as the portion of the film points out, they were able to create a community and a culture. They uh, encounter Jews who had, who had been there uh, already for quite a while, the Baghdadi Jews in the 19th century, the Russian Jews who came at the beginning of the 20th century. And um, when the ghetto was created in February of 1943, now they're all together, these uh, 18 to 20,000 Jews. And they did what they could to maintain culture, identity, education, to educate the children, um, and that's something we also saw in the ghettos of, of, of Poland, for example, the ghettos of Eastern Europe. Um, I think human beings, even under the most extreme circumstances, maybe especially under the most extreme circumstances. As Michael Blumenthal said in the, in the portion of the, of, the, of the film that we, we saw, uh, require and, and desire and, 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 and thrive on the familiar, the, the, uh, the uh, cultural uh, opportunities, expressive opportunities, journalism, writing, um, and so on, and even religion. 
So it's, uh, it's like many, many stories in the Holocaust. You can say, why should we pay attention to 20,000 people when we're talking about the overwhelming destruction of, of 6 million people, maybe more than 6 million Jews? Why should we focus on 20,000 people? And frankly, we have to focus on one person at a time. Everybody is an individual. And what happened in Shanghai has importance on its own, but what happened in Shang Shanghai also has importance for us today in terms of directing our thinking towards, as one of the uh, people in the film said, towards the refugee uh, crises that continue to, uh, to, to overwhelm many, many parts of the world. That is the wonder is, can we be that harbor, whether being as brave as the individuals who stood up and used their office, their opportunities, what they had to change? It just seems I'm impressed at some points with such large forces that a person shifted the direction of things for so many people. And that um, Renee, since we were talking about that sense of preserving culture, no matter what the circumstances, whether it was in Shanghai or whether it was being in a ghetto or in a concentration camp, that people continued to create and educate. This is some of what I think you've been able to share with people by presenting the Holocaust Remembrance Concerts at Eastman. And is there some sense that that sense of preserving culture comes through with what you're presenting or also just if you wanted to respond to hearing some of these stories from the movie from your perspective. Absolutely. It's, it's, I, I completely agree that, that we, we learn about this history and, and these stories, not by just understanding the large numbers, but by really understanding everybody's individual story and, um, Part of my motivation for starting these concerts and featuring these composers is because they were extremely talented people whose stories, uh, whose voices deserve to be heard. Um, and I think that no matter where you go as, as, as a human being, food is important, shelter is important, but it's, it's kind of meaningless without culture. And it's the culture that gives us the will to survive and the will to keep going. Um, and so the fact that, that these refugees in Shanghai or even in the camps, even in the concentration camps, the, the, the death camps, the, the people were able to revive or keep going some semblance of their culture. It, it's really, it's, it's the thing that kept them going. Um, one of the really interesting things in particular about the Shanghai story uh, is, is that maybe uh, between 400 and 450 pro professional musicians emigrated, uh, Jewish musicians emigrated to Shanghai at this time that we're talking about. And um, they became instrumental in the cultural life, not only in their own little community, but in teaching the Chinese uh, classical, Western classical music. Um, many of them played in what was the precursor to the Shanghai Symphony. Um, Thirteen of them taught at the Shanghai Conservatory, and many of them volunteered their services um, to teach at orphanages and things like that. And these people trained the first big generation of Chinese Western classical musicians. And the director of this uh, film, um, her name is Violet Du Fang. Uh, she said that her father was a student, her father was a musician and a student of some of the musicians who were trained by these Jewish musicians and that they consider that their, their heritage, which is, is really quite moving. It's really amazing because, yeah, there's a sense of both trying to preserve a sense of home while being somewhere else, but that you can't go somewhere without both lives being touched, as I think was, you know, both sides being touched as was alluded to in the film. This might be a moment. Actually, I would like to bring Sheila back in. I think you- Yeah, there's something that yeah. I would like to say um, that one of the lessons of learning about this experience and the experiences people had was 
that Jews need a homeland. And they need a place to go to because almost every country shut their doors. So one of the lessons is that we must re retain Israel, we must take care of it, and we must be very aware because anti-Semitism is growing all over the world. It's growing here in America, and it's growing in Europe, and it's growing in so many places. And all of the people that I've ever met who lived in China were so impressed that there was not a bit of anti-Semitism in China. The only anti-Semitism that came was from the white Russians, the, uh, the people who escaped from the Russian Revolution, but they learned anti-Semitism in Russia and they still carry it. So please remember that anti-Semitism is not dead. It can rise up at any time and it hit, is rising and we need a Jewish homeland. And I think in current events, as is alluded to, we've seen, as you said, anti-Semitism, we've seen um, nativist reactions against people coming from different places that are looking for somewhere to be safe when their own home doesn't become safe. And there's a sense of that a century from now or decades from now, someone could be talking about the place that they found refuge and found that place. I want to have all of you talk some more about the movie and I'll take a moment to see if we have some questions from our audience which you can share in the Facebook comments and will be passed along to me so that I can ask them to our panelists. But since we have talked about the music, there's a short segment about what went into creating the sound of this unusual story and I thought it might be interesting to share to sort of continue our discussion with that. So if perhaps our projectionist could share the short segment on the music of the, what, of the harbor from the Holocaust. I am so thrilled and thankful to be involved in this beautiful film, Harbor from the Holocaust, directed by Violet Dufang. I had heard about Jewish refugees living in Shanghai before, but I have never heard any of their individual stories, so this film is really a beautiful way of looking at history and these personal experiences of people who survived the Holocaust by fleeing to Shanghai. On this score, I'm thrilled and happy to have some wonderful collaborators, beginning with Niv Ashkenazi, who plays all the violin solos. I knew Chad back when we were at Juilliard together, but this is the first time getting to actually work with him on this wonderful film. And today I have with me one of the violins of hope. This instrument right here is part of the collection of instruments that have all survived the Holocaust and have been restored by luthiers Amnon Weinstein and Afshi Weinstein. And this is one of their instruments. This is one of the first instruments that they restored and I'm the only person currently that has one of these instruments on long-term loan, so I'm really excited to get to share this instrument with this project. It is uh, about a hundred or so years old, this instrument. It has a beautiful Star of David on the back made out of abalone shell, which is somewhat typical for the time, but we don't see that nowadays. I was born and raised here in California, but my parents are both Israeli and uh, we always would go back to Israel and that's actually where I fell in love with the violin, just seeing a violinist on the street corner playing. But my connection to the Holocaust um, is not personally as direct. My side of the family is from Israel, from Syria and Yemen, but my wife's family was directly impacted by the Holocaust. Her grandparents were married before the war and they ended up being sent to two different concentration camps and miraculously after the war they actually came back and found each other and lived the rest of their lives together. But this is something that's very personal to us as a family and uh, getting to do this work with this instrument has been very special. We recently collaborated on an album together uh, it was the first solo album on one of the Violins of Hope, and my wife, Leah Cohn, who's a bassoonist, she was the one that produced the album. 
The album is called Niv Ashkenazi Violins of Hope and has primarily works by composers that were affected by the Holocaust. Some were in the Holocaust, some managed to escape. And then the rest of the music is all music that has really influenced um, Jewish music as we know it today. We also have Rabbi Avram Lotek, whom I had the wonderful opportunity of meeting in Jerusalem last year at a wedding of a friend. Avram has brought some deep soulfulness and, of course, the cultural um, representation of, of the Jewish faith to the score. Everyone, this is Avram Lotek. Delighted to be working on this project with you all. Uh, it speaks very much to my own family history. As my grandfather, Yossel Mlatek, was a Holocaust refugee, fled Warsaw, and spent the war years in Shanghai. And so I feel privileged to lend my voice to this project. Thank you to everyone involved. And lastly, we're really lucky to have Yo-Yo Ma be playing some of the cello solos on the score, starting with a piece that his father wrote. And he's also playing um, a melody that I've written that's inspired by a tune written by Mordecai Gepertig, who died in the Krakow ghetto in 1942. I hope you can all experience this film. It comes out September 8th on PBS. And I hope this film can uh, help us better understand the plight of refugees around the world today. So seeing that reminded me of something that Renee, you had said to me before, which I found interesting about the concerts that you produce at Eastman, that in a number of the works that are by people from the generation that were either killed in the Holocaust or that survived that, addressing it in their work was not as prominent, but it comes up in later generations. That is often the case. I mean, many of um, the composers that we feature were Western classical composers, and they had various styles that were popular um, in Western, the de development of Western music in the 1920s, 1930s. Um, and even those who managed to write a little bit in the camps, even those pieces, they sound like themselves. They don't sound like so-called you know, Jewish music with Jewish tunes for the most part. Um, and the ones who escaped or survived mostly also sound like themselves, they write in their own styles. Um, and one or two of them took the opportunity to write a couple of pieces or maybe a piece that had some, had a Jewish sounding tune in it. Um, one is uh, Roman Richerand, who uh, survived the war in Switzerland and lost his entire extended family. Um, and he, mostly he wrote in his own style, but he did write these um, three Hebraic tunes for violin and harp that we performed. And another was actually my own father, who um, passed away in early 2014. Uh, this concert in 2014 was already planned before this happened, but um, I took the opportunity to put in one of his pieces, which was also a Jewish tune called A Prayer for Peace. But again, that was not really his style either. Mostly he wrote in, in his sort of modern 20th century style. Um, but some of the other composers that we feature, some modern ones, um, even if it's not their um, their style all the time to write in this way. Uh, when they chose to write about a Holocaust theme or use poetry from the Holocaust in song cycles or anything like that, um, many of them did use a lot of traditional sounding or traditional Jewish tunes in the music. And for some of them, I think it changed a little bit their style going forward as well. They had a certain uh, awareness of their own cultural her heritage from it began to use that in their compositions. And, and that's, that's always really interesting to see, to see a sort of um, a rejuvenation, if you will, of, of the culture. And Michael and Sheila, both of you, Michael in your teaching and Sheila also just in your sort of going around speaking as an advocate, you get to speak to people who are from different generations, ex knowing the story or getting to know the story. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it is to share this and to study this and what it can mean? Well, uh, for me, um, teaching the Holocaust, researching 
uh, the Holocaust, but teaching the Holocaust and working with young people and, and, and uh, older people, adults, you know, particularly in the trips that we take to Germany and Poland. By the way, Sarah Walters was on one of those trips. And um, I would say it's uh, been for me one of the most rewarding and important um, aspects of my teaching and my experience. It's very, very powerful um, when you can connect these stories and this history to people who may not even have a connection, um, but also certainly to people who have a connection. Um, I think one of the powerful points that comes through in the Shanghai story or the story of any of the survivors who are able to share their stories is the ongoing impact of their lives and their experiences going through the generations. I was actually very, very moved and I didn't realize that Avraham Alatek uh, was part of the, you know, the musical side of this. Uh, I know him, um, he has a Rochester connection, his in-laws live in Rochester, his father is the musical director of the Volksbühne in New York City, the Yiddish, the only ongoing standing Yiddish theater. He was the musical director of the Yiddish production of Fiddler, Fiddler on the Roof on Broadway. So he, and, and, and his grandparents survived through Shanghai. So let's just look at this one family. They survived through Shanghai. They came to the United States. They, um, committed the rest of their lives to working on the preservation of Yiddish language and culture. They had children and grandchildren who were continuing that legacy and the broader legacy of enriching the musical experiences and cultural experiences uh, in, in the United States. One family, we can multiply this of course millions of times or well, I wish it were millions of times, but certainly hundreds of thousands of times. It's very, very moving. And when you can actually dis discuss this and show this and display this to, to people, um, they respond very, very powerfully. And uh, as I said, it's, it's been the most gratifying really part of what's been already a very long teaching career for me, but it's been a very, maybe the most gratifying part of it. Thank you. And before I go to Sheila, I do want to point out that apparently in the comments, there is someone here in Rochester who I had known about, Sarah Halpern, who's doing her doctorate on refugees, um, Jewish refugees in China post-World War II. And someone else made a comment about being surprised compared to other places they've lived at not having a Shanghai community. With this. So there's this story, although in some ways I feel, having grown up just with, I guess, a basic education about what things had happened and having heard from survivors, I hadn't known about this whole story. There are others who are very connected to it. And I think this documentary will bring fully more people to have these discussions and be able to connect through these stories. And I, even that musical connection being a surprise with just showing that bit. And Sheila, I'll let you now. Oh, we'll unmute you, I think. I'm not muted on my... Ah, okay. there, you're good. Okay. Um, World War II ended in 1945. The majority of the population wasn't born then. Even some of their parents weren't born then. So um, when you're speaking to older people, they might not have known about the experiences of, uh, of so many of the Jewish populations. They, they know about Jews who lived in Europe, but they didn't know about Jews from the Middle East, they, which was very much part of China. Uh, that was the original settlement for, for people from the Middle East. And they, they certainly don't know about uh, Jews living in, in Asia. So it's very interesting to see that people who do know something about it, maybe they had a brief Holocaust um, experience in high school, so they know about Europe, they know about the concentration camps, but they have no idea that there are survivors who 
did not have that concentration experience, are very grateful that they didn't, but most of their relatives did. So uh, each person that you speak to comes from a different experience. And one of my pleasures is talking to inner city schools. I talk about the Holocaust or about Israel to inner city schools. And it's um, kids who live in tiny little houses with large extended families seem to understand it a little bit better than suburban kids. That's kind of my experience. Well, and it's been hard to confront this story without thinking about what's going on in the news right now as we think about both systems that oppress people and also individuals having their humanity not acknowledged in the way that they are being treated sometimes by people in authority. And so I think while this is a historical story, as we've said a few times, it speaks to an everlasting moment, but especially to a current moment as well. And I did want, before we wrap things up, to ask if each of you had one more thing or anything else you wanted to add before we wrap up our conversation. Well, I would just note, um, you know, t this is the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the Shanghai ghetto. And in fact, it could be literally the 75th anniversary on September 3rd, 1945, when the Shanghai ghetto was essentially liberated, if we can use that word. So it's, a, it's an important time for this documentary to, to appear. Um, uh, uh, I won't repeat what, what has been said before. It reminds us about this history that not too many people know about. And it reminds us of human preservation uh, perseverance and dignity and the struggle for, for perseverance and, dig and dignity, which is critically important in, uh, in our day as it was in, in that period 50 or 75 years ago, 75 years ago, actually. So, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think I would just sort of end with that. For me, the most important thing to remember is that people are people, no matter where they live, no matter what they do, and they want to make life better. And so even in the horrible concentration camps, there were cl classes, people were studying music, they were studying history, they were studying everything. So those people who were lucky enough to go to China continued their life. And even though there was starvation and there were diseases that they had never heard of before, they persevered. And going out into the streets, they could see dead people all the time. My husband always used to talk about swimming in the river and pushing aside dead bodies. Um, it's an experience that, thank God, I've never had and I never would want to have. But the zest for life and all of the people who managed to live, and even though they lost all of their families, life was important. One of the most important principles in Judaism is choose life. And you saw people who chose life. Uh, I... I think it's so important just to understand that every human being has a story. Everybody in some way suffers, some more than others for sure, but there's, everyone should be able to understand what that suffering can feel like. And everybody needs to have hope. And we need each other to fulfill that hope, no matter where we come from or where we live or whatever our culture is. And that's, that's really what's so special about this particular film, because you would never think that the Jewish people and the Chinese people have anything in common, but they do, they absolutely do, and they felt that connection, and that's what saved them. Renee, Sheila, Michael, thank you so much for being a part of this. I know it's a very difficult and emotional topic, so thank you to everyone who stayed with us to experience this. You can see the full documentary on Tuesday, 
at 10 p.m. on WXXI TV. I want to say a special thank you to the Jewish Federation of Greater Rochester for their sponsorship of the event, especially to Sarah Walters for her help in bringing together this discussion. And as well, thank you to our engagement coordinator, Joelle Clance, Michelle Picardo from WXXI, and Chris Fogan Roy and Matt DeTurk at the Little Theater for their technical expertise in keeping everything running behind the scenes. And of course, to PBS for distributing this documentary and making this preview available to us. I'm Mona Segatola Slami. It has been a privilege to have this discussion with all of you. And again, the full program next week, Tuesday, September 8th at 10 p.m. You can find more information online at wxxi.org. Thank you very much and have a good night. Mm -hmm.